coming to today's Rose to Research session. Um, and thanks to those of you who are joining remotely. Uh, it's being live streamed today. We've never done a live stream before. And I think the whole time I've organized Rose to Research sessions, I've only had maybe one single request for a live stream. But for this presentation, I got we got several, including up to a minute before I was leaving uh, to come here. So I'm wondering what the link was. So, so that's great. Lots of interest. Um, and in our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Walenga, who's director of the School of Communication and Culture here at Royal Roads. And the title of her presentation is Fear and Failure, A Sure Path to Create Creativity and Innovation. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Uh, in basketball, we do this. We go, let's hear it for Vanessa Rogers. Uh, Vanessa is just such a support in so many, on so many levels. Um, we usually start all our research meetings with a chat about life and families and stress and all that too, uh, which is also a, a huge support, so thank you. Welcome to the chat. Just uh, such a great opportunity to share some of the work I've been working on kind of behind the scenes for many, many years and realize we, I've never really brought it forward, <laughs> interestingly enough, here. I tend to talk about other things here. But this has been something going on for quite a few years, right from when I went back to school for the hundredth year of my academic experience <laughs> um, around creativity. And I think part of the reason I haven't talked about it much here is that it's funded by somebody else. Uh, my colleagues at UVic always have this nice pot of money to draw on, so I just hitch my wag into their star. Uh, really where all this research started was my interest in optimal performance. Optimal performance meaning how do people access their full potential. I started as a, a teacher, uh, I've had kids since then, uh, always loved education and learning, and I have this, this huge faith in human potential. So uh, I was also an athlete for many years, and I had a real interest in how do we perform even though there's, there are these adverse conditions or uh, challenges that we're facing. Uh, some of the injuries that my colleagues and I have experienced in sport. Uh, this guy, Michael Conley, has a beautiful story about, um, he was a triple jumper from the U.S., 1984 Olympics. He had the gold sewn up, and he had won a couple of jumps left, but he basically had won. He had the, the furthest jump. No one was coming close to him. Uh, he jumps again. He has two jumps left. He jumps again, and he foot faults. If he foot faults a second time, he's disqualified. So suddenly, the whole environment of his uh, performance is changing. And he stopped for a moment before his final jump. And you know when you're stressed out about something like skiing through trees, if you look at the tree, you're going to hit the tree, right? So he's now thinking about foot fault, foot fault, foot fault. <laughs> and it's really hard to remove that from your focus. But what he did was reflected on, so what if I lose? What if I lose the gold? You know, something I've worked for my whole life. <laughs> and what if, I, what if it just slips through my fingers here. And he realized, as he reported later, that it really came down to his family. Uh, he really, he did it because um, his family had always supported him, had always told him to just do his best, and, and that's what he came back to, these core values. He went on to jump, an amazing jump. He broke world records, he broke his own record, he won the gold, obviously, but he went even beyond what he had previously been capable of. And that was such a fascinating story to me, because here he is in this adverse conditions, and yet achieving and extending beyond his, uh, his potential. Stories, uh, and I just start following these stories. I'm so interested in these athletes. I then have children. There's my daughter smashing someone. Um, <laughs> but watching my kids, she doesn't get it from me. I'm very peaceful. Um, my kids, I started watching my kids and, and, and the kids I was teaching. And, studying them. They're always part of my research without them knowing it, right? Always observing and studying and thinking about things and then pursuing new avenues of understanding. Hi, welcome. Uh, I started working with organizations, so looking at performance, not necessarily, you know, CEOs who can dunk a basketball, but looking into organizations and performance within that context and how to optimize performance. And of course, I've always been a teacher. I taught middle school for about 25 years and have always loved working with kids and individuals, adults, doesn't matter, but looking at these kids facing their personal challenges and how can I help facilitate greater performance. And performance meaning learning, uh, athletic, physical, emotional, any kind of, kind of achievement. 
And where I found myself in, down this very random and chaotic path that I tend to follow is creative thinking, creativity and creative thinking, because most people in challenging situations have to have to draw on their capacity to be creative. If you think of someone like a Wayne Gretzky, you know, he's known for his creative capacity, his ability to see and read and pull together some very cool maneuver that uh, helps him stick handle literally through difficult situations. So in uh, thinking about creative thinking, as I read about creative thinking and, and creative problem solving, it really drills down to this concept of creative thinking is how many ways can you think of to use a brick? So, I, and this is a test. It's also a measurement of uh, creative thinking. And so it has many components that I, can, I could explain later, but I'm not going to get into today. But if I ask you, how many ways can you think of to use one brick? What, would you, what are some of your ideas that pop to mind? Table. Balance the table. Doorstop. Doorstop. Hammer. Hammer. Jewelry <laughs> And there are all sorts of components of creative thinking, you know, that uh, you can use to measure someone's capacity, uh, how many ideas they come up with, and whether they elaborate one idea. And, you know, you go with your idea of breaking into something. Well, what else could you break into? Or how else could you use this as a smashing device? And, you elaborate, it's called. So there are components of creative thinking. Um, but this then led me down the path of insight. What if you don't have a brick? What goes on in your mind when I ask you that question? So what if you don't have a brick? Use something else. For what? What's a brick for? <laughs> Throwing at the jewelry thief. Yeah, yeah. Great. So you've, you've just automatically gone through this process of trying to understand, well, what problem am I actually trying to solve? And that's often what's missing in the creativity literature. You know, we can generate ideas and being very creative, but in creative problem solving, um, it's not just about creativity. It's also about this problem solving component or the problem framing. And when we link back to those optimal performers, you know, they're framing their problem and they're drilling down to some solutions. They're incorporating some creative thought, definitely but there are many phases to the process. I started to do some studies around training insight and some puzzles that we would use uh, in a very experimental condition to work with individuals to understand what's going on within their brains when they're trying to uh, be more insightful. And this is a classic insight problem. Give it a go. If These are all little matchsticks, these little black things here and they're matchsticks on a table. And you can only move three. How can you change the pattern on the right to look like the pattern on the left? You can only move three sticks. Some people got it? Yeah. What tends to happen, people are over here and they start moving, I might, they start moving uh, sticks around and they're trying to basically, when you talk to them, they're trying to understand their process. They tend to focus down here because they're trying to create this. And they tend to move the sticks or they want to flip it and, and that's, you can't, that's all, that's more than three sticks and, or it's flipping, you're moving all eight or, so uh, when I try to understand this, you know, people spend a lot of energy here. When you get them to let go a little bit, they realize, oh, I don't have to, if I'm trying to create this square, I could create that square anywhere and there'd be actually some more efficient places to try and create that. And then you see them move up here. They create the square here and go up. But there's an interesting phenomenon that happens to individuals, and that's one of the answers. There are all other ways of achieving that solution. Interesting, happens, interesting things happen with individuals in that they feel constrained. We impose constraints right away. We uh, follow assumptions. We um, operate out of habit. And assumptions around this problem are that we have to stay on this one line somehow. You know? We can't go out of that box. There's another one uh, coming up later in the presentation that really illustrates that feeling of constraint. So we played with puzzles and we learned a lot about how people create a uh, problem solve and, and how they achieve insight. And a lot of it is about letting go of those assumptions, letting go of those constraints, and being able to kind of think beyond. It's also, also kind of a converging process where you're thinking, well, what is the problem I'm actually trying to solve? And when I talk to people, they say, well, I'm trying to build this little box in the corner. And I was able to then 
facilitate a shift in their focus by saying, well, where else can you build that box? Or what if you can't build it there with only three sticks? And suddenly they'd expand their thinking a little bit. Hey? So that's puzzles. Now, if we go into reality, I have a beautiful uh, video I want to share with everyone in the world. This is Amy Purdy. If your life were a book and you were the author, how would you want your story to go? That's the question that changed my life forever. Growing up in the hot Las Vegas desert, all I wanted was to be free. I would daydream about traveling the world, living in a place where it snowed, and I would picture all of the stories that I would go on to tell. At the age of 19, the day after I graduated high school, I moved to a place where it snowed, and I became a massage therapist. With this job, all I needed were my hands and my massage table by my side, and I could go anywhere. For the first time in my life, I felt free, independent, and completely in control of my life. That is, until my life took a detour. I went home from work early one day with what I thought was the flu, and less than 24 hours later, I was in the hospital on life support with less than a 2% chance of living. It wasn't until days later, as I lay in a coma, that the doctors diagnosed me with bacterial meningitis a vaccine-preventable blood infection. Over the course of two and a half months, I lost my spleen, my kidneys, the hearing in my left ear, and both of my legs below the knee. When my parents wheeled me out of the hospital, I felt like I had been pieced back together like a patchwork doll. I thought the worst was over, until weeks later when I saw my new legs for the first time. The calves were bulky blocks of metal with pipes bolted together for the ankles and a yellow rubber foot with the raised rubber line from the toe to the ankle to look like a vein. I didn't know what to expect, but I wasn't expecting that. With my mom, by my side, and tears streaming down our faces. I strapped on these chunky legs, <laughs> and I stood up. They were so painful and so confining that all I could think was, how am I ever going to travel the world in these things? How was I ever going to live the life full of adventure and stories as I always wanted? And how was I going to snowboard again? That day, I went home, I crawled into bed, and this is what my life looked like for the next few months. Me passed out, escaping from reality, with my legs resting by my side. I was absolutely physically and emotionally broken. But I knew that in order to move forward, I had to let go of the old Amy and learn to embrace the new Amy. And that is when it dawned on me that I didn't have to be five foot five anymore. I could be as tall as I wanted. <laughs> or as short as I wanted, depending on who I was dating. <laughs> and if I snowboarded again, my feet aren't going to get cold. And best of all, I thought, I can make my feet the size of all the shoes that are on the sales rack. <laughs> and I did. So there are benefits here. <laughs> it was this moment that I asked myself that life-defining question. If my life were a book 
and I were the author. How would I want this story to go? And I began to daydream. I daydreamed like I did as a little girl. And I imagined myself walking gracefully, helping the other people through my journey, and snowboarding again. And I didn't just see myself carving down a mountain of powder. I could actually feel it. I could feel the wind against my face and the beat of my racing heart as if it were happening in that very moment. And that is when a new chapter in my life began. But I think that first part of it really captures the point of where we've gone with our research and that the letting go of the reality, the coming up against failure and her laying there in that bed, you know, wanting to kind of just escape but realizing this isn't sustainable either, wanting to give up. And that's the power of failure. It doesn't mean you all have to go there <laughs> to access the creativity that she accessed. Because she also points out the power of imagination. We can imagine that crisis point. We can push ourselves up against, so what if I lose, like Michael Conley did with his jump, right? What if I lose it all? And imagine what that really does mean. But come up against that failure as a very freeing experience, actually, for many reasons I'll explain. Um, she also talks later on in the video about barriers and limits and how they are a springboard. Failure, barriers, and limits are a springboard to your core, your core values, who you are, what you actually are trying to achieve. You know, her uh, ability to imagine the, the wind against her face back on the mountain, and she does snowboard again. Does she ever? It's a fantastic story. And she does amazing things across the world. But the power of imagination is very strong, and we, uh, I don't think we always capitalize on it. This led us to a very basic model that actually hasn't changed in a long time. It's very basic. Uh, there are, are individuals, and they have values and goals. But life has a way of throwing barriers in the way. I work with lots of athletes, so even something as uh, innocuous as the rain can pose a barrier. Even though, is the rain really a bad thing? No, of course not, right? But it can pose a barrier to certain individuals. Uh, there are all sorts of barriers in our lives. They can be individuals, uh, work structures, um, you know, uh, our thinking. So many kinds of barriers can exist. But they get in the way, and what we typically do as human beings is focus on that barrier. And that becomes a problem. And you've totally lost sight of your values and goals. It's blocked them out completely. And that causes problems for us, too, because we, we end up solving kind of the wrong problems or diverting our energy towards something that's not as productive. And you start to feel like you're hammering your head against that barrier, too, which can be hugely unproductive and can actually plummet people into depression. So instead, I call on people to, to explore the barrier. And this is the big insight for our research, is that it isn't about letting go of the barrier or ignoring it or moving away from it. It's, it's embracing it, understanding it, because it actually leads you right back to your values. Something's only a barrier because it threatens what you care about. It's getting in the way of something. So it actually holds all these clues for you. It's more complicated than that, though, because human beings are complicated. Right? And we tend to, again, face, we think of barriers as um, something to be fought against. Or we don't want to think about them at all, the whole fight or flight biology, biological reaction to things. Right? So it's not as easy to just say, hey, you just understand your, embrace your barriers, and they'll lead you to your core values again. Uh, it's more complicated than that, and I'll explain a little more. But when we are able to drill down and understand it a little bit better, it brings us back to our values. We start to understand what this is getting in the way of, and we see that again. And it, you actually end up inhabiting that space right there between the barrier and your values and coming up with creative solutions. You're in a place where you can come up with some creative solutions that take into consideration both things, not just the barrier and not just your values and goals. 
here's how we typically, I'm gonna get back to you actually. Um, how we typically react to <laughs> situations that are problematic. Two people stuck on an escalator, and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, not enough left to do. Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. Sometimes we do. You know, you look for your keys in the same place 18,000 times. <laughs> you know, you know they're not there. We, cut, we get caught in these fixation rumination patterns, right? Where we forget what it is we're actually trying to achieve or what we have available to us, like our legs in this case. And actually, that phenomenon applies in climbing. If anybody's ever done some rock climbing, you sometimes forget you have legs because you're so gripped mm -hmm. with your fingers. So we do tend to, uh, or can tend to respond to a problem situation like that where we're focused on the barrier, the broken escalator, and we're forgetting what we're actually trying to achieve or what are uh, tools available to us. How do we move from that sort of stuck place to something that's a little more creative? It's another area of our research that we explore. So here's another example. So what facilitates a shift from that stuck place of where you see the elevator is broken to a place where you can think more creatively? And I like to just depose those two videos because they're both around escalators and stairs. And I think their data was a bit skewed, actually, because at some point, it's so busy on the stairs that people 
have to take the elevator or escalator, you know, like you can see they're reluctantly going on that escalator. Great stuff. So we started doing some studies around, okay, well, what, what unlocks people? Because we definitely noticed with our puzzle studies that people would get locked in a certain way of thinking. They'd get focused on that barrier. So that was a great insight for us. But now we're going to the next stage. How do we unlock them? We're really interested in that space between the action and then the result. What's going on in between? And so I did some reading. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, and it's amazing how you've all gone through this, right, where you start reading about something and then, especially with the internet, right, you start wandering off or when you're doing a lit review and suddenly you're way over here. How did I get over here? And how do I get back? But so much reading and pulling together and luckily I like to make connections. So I was definitely making some connections. And what I found in the literature is that we think of problem solving as lots of ideas, and then let's find a good one. And that's really dangerous uh, when we're trying to be insightful and sustainable and elegant and systemic. And what we found was that it would probably be more productive, in the new hypothesis, to find the problem first. So converge first, and then come up with solutions, which flips the literature around creative problem solving right on its head. Fun. <laughs> Try and prove that. <laughs> so we started reading a little bit more, and I came back full circle. You know as it is, right? Very iterative. Back to peak performance again. Okay, so how does that work? And reading about flow and I'm going to go back to that. Optimism, <laughs> locus of control, and all these sort of factors that flow into performance and, and achieving potential. And I did a study with some soccer players at uh, UVic, but in the context of organizational change, I was very interested in, in big groups and how they, how they deal with change. And what came out of that study that was very uh, fundamental to the work we were doing and along this path of insight was this idea of um, acknowledging failure or acknowledging a lack of control and accepting it, not resignedly, but accepting and moving on and how, how acceptance allowed people to then move into this other space of creativity. And we found the more experienced players were, were kind of the more humble players. They were the ones who were very clear on their limitations and then able to be much more creative and productive and um, higher performers because of that capacity. Again, very counterintuitive. It wasn't what we expected most people would expect. They went on to the, that little group of soccer players, just as a side note, went on, after doing a lot of exploration around this and trying some of our strategies, they went on to win the national championships that year, 2005. Uh, this brought us to looking at the adversity piece, you know, so how do people solve problems when they're feeling stressed, like the people on the escalator, right, and, uh, or in the face of adversity, they're feeling stuck. It typically does make them feel stuck when they're under stress. And we're much uh, poorer problem solvers when we're stressed out. Again, you know, you'll notice that fixation will start to happen. It's very unproductive thinking, right? You'll just start spinning, laying in bed, having the same conversation over and over again. It's not very productive. But we do it very naturally, and for good reasons. So it wasn't until, until we really started to think about, well, what are the good reasons for getting stuck? for spinning, for ruminating, for fixating, that we started to uncover some of these other possibilities and, and understand this. So again, lots of reading. And what we realized uh, through a lot of the reading and the theory out there, and you know whether it's true or not, or the answer, it's where we are now, that in fact stress can really limit our thinking. It can in fact mess with our prefrontal cortex, and it has these kind of Im impacts. It triggers um, certain centers of the brain and perceived threat, because it's not always a real threat, right? It's just perceived, it's real for you. And worry can result in a deactivation of the cortex of the brain. And that creates a threatened, hy hy or sorry, heightened threat vigilance, which narrows your focus and makes you unable to see other possibilities. Like the guys on the ex escalator, right? They couldn't remember they had legs to walk with. So it has all these impact on you when you're going through stress. It's really important for you to recognize that and that we are poor problem solvers when we're stressed out. However, stress is also very useful. We have to have it in order to grow. So how do we, um, how do we capitalize or use our stress more effectively, more productively, that we are interested in? There has to be some sort of intervention or shift. I started reading about um, 
stress-related growth, use stress, going back to Selye, and he goes way beyond this. Anxiety direction, our interpretation of anxiety actually has more of an impact than the anxiety itself. The stress is just a reality. Let me go back to that. Um, we talked about cue utilization, which is that narrowing of focus that happens. It happens for good reasons, right? It hones us in on the threat. That can be really a powerful mechanism. Um, interpretive bias plays a role. It has to. We have to kind of appraise our situation and then, and, and then uh, draw conclusions about it. It all helps us, but it can also hinder us. So understanding these uh, theories and phenomena can help us capitalize on our capacities much more effectively instead of just reacting. That led us to um, a study on injured workers. You know, how do people deal with that kind of adversity within their workplace? You're injured. How do you reframe that injury so that you can get back to work, you can overcome it? And out of that, we were really, actually, again, it was very experimental. We were trying some interventions to try to facilitate people through that stuck place. Especially in that great photo. <laughs> I've got about 20 photos. You see what they're actually doing there? What's the guy doing over here on the left? He's holding his belt. He's holding a mattress in the car. Yeah, you want to talk to your car? People do that. Yeah. Like, that's really unhelpful. Anyway, uh, what came out of this study was this idea of reframing. That really is about reframing and helping them see their injury a little bit differently. Uh, it's not changing the injury in any way, but helping them understand the real barriers, what the barriers are actually interfering with, and, and accepting their limit, which is their injury, and moving beyond it. Uh, a good example of this friend of mine had an injured hip, and she was focusing on the hip, you know, going, she wanted to run again and do all these things that she loved to do and train, but she kept going back to physio, back to physio, nothing was working, she was so frustrated, and she was just focusing more and more and more on this injury. And it was debilitating in itself, right? So we sat for a day and had some coffee in the afternoon, and I asked her, you know, what's really bothering you about the injury? What's it getting in the way of? And you just saw her shift right there, right? She starts thinking about what she's actually, what she actually cares about, what's getting in the way of, what she's actually trying to achieve, and it's this reality of hers. She said, well, it's a way to, uh, I know I want to run. I said, well, if you can't run, what does that get in the way of? Well, I can't relieve my stress. What does that get in the way of? Uh, my relationship, actually, she said, with my husband. Because if I can't get rid of my stress, I come home and I dump it on him, and that's not really helping us as, as a couple. And right then, she, on her own, you know, with, a, with no intervention from me from that point on, she realized, oh, it's really about my relationship, not about my injury. And how do I attend to my relationship while I'm injured in a way that takes into consideration the fact that I'm injured? So she's not forgetting about that but she's expanding her problem frame to include both. And she went, yoga, <laughs> like that, it was so cute. And from then on, she came, became a bit of a yoga Nazi, actually, it was taking it all and <laughs> yoga. And, but it was great, it, it allowed her to achieve her goals while acknowledging her the barrier, which was a real uh, insight. And we saw this happen again and again with the injured workers. They started to generate creative solutions that achieved the actual goals while they were injured. And it actually helps their healing because they're not so fixated on the injury and, and um, in that plummeting themselves into that place where they're actually <coughs> not very healthy. It also led to some work that Wendy Rowe and I have been doing around stress in the workplace and how to help people transform stress. Is stress going anywhere? Are resources going to suddenly become more plentiful? Is time going to be more plentiful? It seems like the world's speeding up when I think about it. So I'm not sure stress is going anywhere. So I, our, our hypothesis is that we need to learn to understand, acknowledge, and, trans and then transform the stress so that we can find creative solutions despite the fact that our environments are frantic and crazy. Uh, I love the climbing. I have little pictures strewn throughout the presentation, but can you see the climber here? She's kind of blending in with the rock. Oops. <clears throat> so this idea of knowing your limitations or knowing fear. I like this, this phrase, no fear, because we're told all the time, no fear, like N-O fear, right? And I really struggle with that from good old Nike. Because I think uh, the fact is people are afraid, and we need to help them understand what that's about and be a little gentler with people instead of just ordering them not to have fear. 
We all have fears. And there's a real value in simply exploring what those fears are and being honest with yourself about what they are because they lead you right to your values, which is a more productive place to be creative. And they allow you to expand the frame to include your fear, but also your values. And that barrier's real, but my values are real too. And how do I achieve the values despite these barriers that are getting in the way? So we're back to our little model. And it just kept getting confirmed that, yeah, we bang our head against the wall, but understanding our barrier can lead us to our values and help us move into that space where we can be a little more creative. It's an integrated problem frame, which led us to the title of uh, the model integrated focus. This concept of fear being a beacon that really does reveal your core. Don't be afraid to exploit fear. And yet we are afraid to talk about fear in our society. Uh, sometimes I've posed it in larger groups or with an individual, and depending on the individual, I'll say, so what are you afraid of? Oh, well, well I'm not afraid of anything, you know. Who's that? Um, Tim Allen. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. So I'll change my language a little bit and say, well, what concerns you? What bothers you? It's the same question, really, but it helps people explore uh, what's getting in the way. And this led us all to, also to this concept of readiness, and I love this concept of readiness. Um, it feeds into research around change, you know, people resisting change. And we argue instead that it's more about just helping people get ready for the change. Change is happening all the time. Usually people are resisting it because it, they're protecting something, so it helps them understand what that is and help them feel more ready. But also being ready to see creative solutions, or ready to problem solve. Um, it, it, it's a process. You're not going to see things if your focus is completely narrowed and all you're noticing are the threats. Right? So how do you help people expand their focus? Well, they have to be in a, an emotional and a cognitive position to do so. So again, we started looking at change and behavioral control, self-efficacy, decisional latitude, lots of different theories figure into our work. And, and it led us to another um, few studies on training insight, training problem solving, training uh, facilitating change in organizations. And we arrived at this concept that <clears throat> people first need to be ready to seek alternatives, to actually look for other solutions, uh, solutions that don't involve banging their head against the wall. Because people will bang their head against the wall for quite a while. They'll fight the barrier for quite a while. You know, you look for your keys. I look for them like maybe 20 times in the same place. They've got to be on this table, you know, looking behind the plant. So it's amazing how many times we'll keep going to the barrier until we suddenly realize, hmm, I'm a little stuck right now. And you throw your hands up. So that's a readiness feeling, right? I'm ready to look for another alternative. Maybe not using my car today or whatever it is or finding a ride, or calling a cab. And that then, when you get to that point where you're ready to look for other alternatives, you're also then ready to see alternatives, see those solutions, which is what uh, our friend here is talking about, you know, the seed for discovery of can plant in a, in a mind that's actually prepared to see them. And failure, we think, really plays a role in that, because when you come up against that barrier, what it, the barrier of failure, that crisis point, that's when you really have to just acknowledge that you're done. And it actually puts you in a position of being ready to seek alternatives. So failure is a very positive thing as well. Fear and failure. Bring them on. We noticed with our experiments with the little puzzles that people had to get stuck before they were willing to even listen to any of the questions I had for them. <laughs> so I had to wait and be patient. Let them get stuck. And then once they really felt stuck, and I'd say, you know, how's it going? Come on, if you want. Um, and they'd be like, ah, oh, I, just, I just can't do it. And then they'd look at me, and I could ask my questions, and they'd, they'd be able to respond. It's a pretty, pretty cool process. Uh, this is another one. I can send this, this PowerPoint out. I'd love to share all the links, but I don't know if I'm, I don't want to run over time too much here, and I only have a few minutes left. But this is, you know, the story of Apollo 13 where they just encounter problem after problem after problem. But this is a beautiful one. And this is a, a reenactment in a movie, but they talk about how they've got to figure out how to 
create a filter, <coughs> or they're all going to, all the astronauts were going to die, a filter that would fit on a round hole, but all they had was this square filter. So they had to, with the tools they had and the equipment they had up in space, they had to come up with a solution that would create this ability to filter the air. Okay? And I uh, love it, because talk about constraints, barriers, you know, limitations. They only had so many things to work with. But the problem was also defined very clearly. This is all we got, and we only have a, a certain amount of time. And in the movie, you know, they dramatize it beautifully, but the guy's like, failure's not an option. <laughs> it's great. The creativity under constraint. And there are tons of wonderful stories that we can learn from that incorporate these concepts of the power of failure or the power of fear. Kidney chains is a great one. Do people know about kidney chains? So, uh, what's his name, Gareth Hill, I think? This guy, yeah. His daughter needed a kidney. And, of course, the way the system works, you go on a wait list if there isn't a match. Well, there wasn't a match in her, his family. And he, of course, was dying to give his daughter one of his kidneys, but there was no match. So now she's on a wait list. A precarious situation to be in. Talk about fear. And feeling a failure, too. Okay? There's nothing you can do. You feel so hopeless. We started to think about it and realize that in that place of crisis, I think we do, we can become so creative because you have to be. He started to think about the problem a little bit differently. That, yeah, there is no match, but it's not really about a match. It's about the number of kidneys that are available, and right? I need to find a kidney. So he suddenly realized there are lots of kidneys because there are lots of guys like me willing to donate one to their daughters. So if we get together, we can donate a kidney and make sure it gets to a daughter that created a chain, maybe eight people. And my kidney may not go to my brother, but it's going to go to her brother, and her kidney will go to his father. Beautiful. So elegant and sustainable, and of course, lots of other challenges, I'm sure, but it had to do with really coming up with a database that can track these people and get them together. Post-it notes, right? They're based on a failure. Something that wasn't sticky enough. Uh, the H1N1 uh, virus and Disney cues. This is a remote association at its best, bringing two very diverse ideas together to make something creative, but solving a, a very dire problem situation as well. And then the little rock video link, you've probably seen this kind of old, but the guys who come up with the uh, rock video where they're singing their song on treadmills, doing a little dance on treadmills. So it's in there embedded. Just click on it when I send it out to everybody. Uh, brilliant, but they're, you know, limited resources, right? And they see the fitness center and think, what can we do at the fitness center? It's right next door. I got a buddy who works there and we have access to the equipment. Can you rock video in there somehow, you know? And they created an amazing one that had billions of hits and it's really fun. Oh yeah, the fast pass. I, Got distracted. <laughs> Disney cues. So the idea of, uh, of queuing theory was then applied to the H1N1 virus. So instead of lining up and waiting for your, um, what's it called? Vaccination. Well, let's organize, right? Let's just organize and use queuing theory and, and sign up for a time when you would actually get it instead of everybody panicking and running and lining up. Right? It's not as productive or creative. So failure is really powerful. It's uh, accepting and letting go and making a cognitive shift and being ready, open to a new idea, seeking <laughs> alternatives, accepting limitations. Does it mean we all have to fail or hit a crisis point? I'm not sure. That's my big question right now. Because right now, based on all the studies that we've done, yeah, it seems to be <laughs> that people need to come up against a wall, literally. And we don't seem all that great at using our imaginations to to imagine failure rather than experience it. So we'll see what we can do with that. We're working on it. Mm -hmm. We're back to our puzzles and because uh, they, you know, those circles, we just keep coming back to, okay, what did we learn at the beginning and what can we add on now? But we're at this point now, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go ahead. You can try some of these little puzzles as well. To this idea of framing and good old word timer and the gestalt, gestalt psychologists, you know, knew this stuff a long time ago. But 
a more penetrating view about framing the problem, expanding the frame. And we've arrived at some great insights, piecing all these little parts of our studies together and generating models that we're then, then testing as interventions. That has something to do with appraisal. And we realize that uh, we can we appraise a situation, but it's our appraisal of our abilities, our resources, that secondary appraisal that really holds the key. And if we can accept that we don't have control over something, accept our limitations, accept our failures as just a springboard, like Amy Purdy did, and a springboard into the new reality, that allows us to generate really systemic and sustainable solutions and uh, move forward. When we generate solutions that are really just more problems, <laughs> we just get back on that wheel. We create a new plan. Has anybody experienced that in an organization? <laughs> Here's a solution. <laughs> it ends up having many branches and arms. So we pulled uh, that thinking into this uh, other paper around, which is just a conceptual model, re really, around um, reflecting these ideas. I invite you to read when you're really bored someday. <laughs> Back to our little model. And I think uh, the lovely thing about simple models is that you're, you're actually making them more complex the more you understand. But we move from that naive simplicity to a profound simplicity of just greater understanding. It's still simple. It's still about understanding the barriers, what they're getting in the way of and generating creative solutions in that new space, expanding our view. We also have explored the power of inquiry and dialogue and narrative. And narrative is important because it involves this dilemma piece, right, which is really transformative learning. And we started to uh, construct an intervention that's really based on just questions and dialogue with people, it helps facilitate them through the process of problem solving. We typically focus on barriers, or people tell us to just focus on the goal. And what we do is try to get people to think of the barrier and the goal together in a systemic problem frame and generate more creative systemic solutions. And that's taken us out into uh, the consulting work I've done with lots of organizations. And here's what our facilitated uh, intervention looks like. It's just questions, simple ones. What's the problem? Are there solutions that are working? If they aren't, let's accept that. What's getting in the way? What's important? The values become, come into view. And once the values are in view and you recognize the barriers, you can generate creative solutions together. It's not easy. The work really starts right there. It's easy for if you're you know, facilitating to get people to that space. Now they need to be creative. Please uh, write or ask me for links or papers or anything that you'd be interested in uh, reading more on. I always welcome people into the, the research process because obviously it's one that has multiple tentacles and we're <laughs> always involving as many people as we can. Or if you want to know more, it was really just a snapshot summary of many years of work. So uh, I really appreciate you letting me invite you into my crazy world <laughs> of complexity. And, um, and problems. Thank you. Any questions? I'm curious, like, just where you land on um, systemic, like when the problems are actually systemic, and it's not 
Like that's where I feel like I'm always coming up against. So I'm just curious where you want it. Sure. People start feeling, oh, it's too complex. Oh, we can't even bother. And I think that's a plague of our organizations nowadays, right, in our communities, is that we think it's too complicated or too complex, and so there's no point. But in fact, I really believe, and I've seen it in action in some of those organizations I've worked with, where it doesn't matter how complex it is. You can, you can, I always say, you can kind of jump on that wheel. I showed you those round models or those circular models. You can jump on at any point and identify you know, what the barrier might be for you. It doesn't have to be everyone's barrier. It's just a barrier, and that can give you insight in how you can navigate the complex challenge. Um, the key is that big problem frame, right? So you actually want to include as many components of the frame as you can. If it's a complex organization, then that means involving as many of uh, the aspects of the organization as you can, putting them on the table, and working through to generate a systemic solution. It's always positive if you have everyone in the room, right? I mean, I just experienced it with the um, enrollment planning process that we do here. We had, I don't know how many units around the table. And I always joke with my buddies, you know, row, rows, you never have a meeting of less than 30 people. <laughs> you have as many as you can in the room, and it worked. We came up with some great solutions, and it gets heated and tense sometimes because people are protecting their territory, but the conversation was very productive, and you could throw something out there, and then someone would say, yeah, but, when do you always take that, actually? And just, yeah. <laughs> but, and that's great, because then, oh, yeah, yeah, we got to think about that, too, and that component. And you're holding it all in your brain, which we're totally capable of doing, and you come up with a much more sustainable solution, because it's considered everything. It's possible. What do you do when the barrier is very dedicated to being a barrier? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking like, tell Obama to focus on values and goals and ignore the Republicans? Good luck. <laughs> exactly. And that's, I think, the key point is that we can't ignore them, right? They're not going away. Barriers are often immovable. And, and I often say they're just reality. So the better, the quicker we acknowledge a barrier as a reality, like the Republicans, probably <laughs> 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 not a barrier for everybody, but uh, the quicker we acknowledge them as a barrier and as a reality that isn't going to go anywhere, the better. Because then we can say, all right, what's our, what is, our problem includes them. How do we achieve what we want? Our focus on values and, what did you say? Values and values? What else is there? Any values <laughs> while they're in the room, while they're here in our reality. How do we achieve that given that we have this reality? That's the key piece because we can try to generate these solutions or achieve values or values-based leadership all we want, but if that bar barrier is a big thorn in our side, it's going to be pretty hard, right? So the best thing to do is to acknowledge them and acknowledge the challenges <coughs> they pose for us in achieving our goals. If that thinking, now, now my barriers, how do I get to a mom and tell them that, you know? <laughs> how do we help people see that, hey, we can think about this problem a lot differently, because there's a real reluctance as well, and a lack of faith. And even looking at Royal Rosie, I mentioned the, the structure we have around enrollment planning now, and that's taken a while to get there, okay? And it also then took three years for us to be able to authentically be at that table, and not be afraid to make a proposal, or challenge something, or point out another concern that you might not want to put stick your neck out over. Okay? So there's that part, too, of trust building. And often someone will say, well, here's the barrier, and then we'll solve that situation, but then there'll be another barrier poke up, and I'll see them just poking up like this. But that's reality too, right? That you're going to continue to encounter the next barrier. So there, you're, I can see you thinking that now that you're here in the middle. <laughs> How do we achieve a values-based society with the kinds of barriers that exist? real challenge. And that's what I meant by the work doesn't, that's when it begins. The work really begins once you frame the problem to include the barrier and your goals. Okay? That really is where we now need to use Osborne's creative problem solving techniques to, to generate really creative ideas and, and pull out those capacities that we all have. And some are better at uh, things, uh, better at certain things than others are, right? We all have strengths 
within that realm of creative thinking. Creative thinking isn't just coming up with ideas. It's all sorts of kinds of thinking. Mm -hmm. We all have the capacity. Anything else? Thank you all. So there are no other questions. So thank Jennifer so much for taking time out of her busy schedule to be with us and share some of this really practical useful <laughs> in our everyday life research. So join me in the We'll send out the PowerPoint too because there's also the links. Oh, right. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.